Welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings leading minds from the energy industry to discuss the challenges and trends that are transforming and modernizing our energy system. And new for 2024, our listeners can now submit a recorded question. Just go to Power Perspectives on Energy Central and look for the link labeled SpeakPipe. We may select your question and recorded voice to be on a future episode. And a quick thank you to West Monroe, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. I'm Jason Price, Energy Central podcast host and director with West Monroe. Today, sitting in the Michigan Memorial Phoenix Project at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And with me on the line from Orlando, Florida, is Energy Central producer and community manager, Matt Chester. Matt, we've got an exciting program. First, I'm sitting on the campus of this year's college football national champion. So congratulations to the Wolverines. Yeah, and uh, also the uh, home of the number one nuclear engineering department in the country. Thank you for that. And second, we are discussing the future of hydrogen and the federally sponsored hydrogen hubs with two of the nation's leading minds on the hydrogen economy. We did have Todd Allen on the show in 2023. So before we bring on our guests, can you give us a skinny, Matt, on that episode and what is a hydrogen hub? Sure, Jason, and, and you're right. The regular listeners of this podcast will recognize one of today's guests from a few months back in episode number 139 titled guiding utilities of the future via energy market analysis. And in that conversation, we learned some of the collaboration that the University of Michigan was doing with Idaho National Laboratory as it pertains to studying economics, technologies, and more to determine how nuclear can evolve as a part of the overall energy sector. And I'll be sure to, to link to that episode in this episode's show notes, but today we're pivoting to look at the future of energy from a hydrogen perspective as well, namely via one of the hydrogen hubs selected by the federal government for recent investment. And as the Department of Energy defines them, hydrogen hubs are networks of hydrogen producers, consumers, and connective infrastructure, all aimed at fast-tracking the large-scale production and use of clean hydrogen in that future energy economy. Well, thanks for that, Matt. And I have the distinct honor to be in person with Todd Allen on this beautiful and historic campus. And I'm here because this winter, the U.S. Department of Energy made its long-anticipated selection of hydrogen hubs across the country. The Midwest Alliance for Clean Hydrogen, referred to as the Mach H2, is one of the seven selected hubs that will help coordinate and jumpstart a regional hydrogen economy. The University of Michigan is one of the key participants in the Mach H2 and leading this at the university are my two guests. So first, let me introduce Professor Todd Allen. Todd is the department chair at the University of Michigan's Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences and the founding director of the Fastest Path to Zero Initiative. Professor Allen, thank you for hosting us today. Yeah, really glad to join you again. And Todd and I are joined virtually by one of Todd's colleagues in the University of Michigan's hydrogen team, Professor Greg Keolian. Greg is the co-director of My Hydrogen, and that's My as in MI for Michigan, the university's cross-campus center to create hydrogen solutions that accelerate the clean and just energy transitions. And he also has served as Michigan's Peter M. Wege Professor of Sustainable Systems since 2001. Professor Keolian, welcome to Power Perspectives Podcast. Glad to be joining the program today. Let's get started, gentlemen. So government funding aside, both of you have been studying H2 for a long time. Greg, I'll start with you first. Please describe where are we today with hydrogen and what is needed to get from where we are today to a future where hydrogen is an integrated part of our energy system? And second, do you feel the federal effort with the H2 hubs is going to get us there? Sure. So I'll give you a quick overview of hydrogen today. It's primarily used as a feedstock for petroleum refining, the chemical industry. There are some fuel applications in buildings. Uh, they're used in forklift, fuel cell buses. About 10 million metric tons a year are produced in the United States, and that's currently done by steam methane reforming of natural gas which generates a lot of carbon dioxide emissions, which therefore problematic, like 7 to 10 kilograms CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. 
But hydrogen can play a really important role in decarbonizing economic sectors in our transportation, industrial sectors, where particularly electrification is problematic. But in order to decarbonize, we need to shift from steam methane reforming to using clean electricity, renewables, nuclear, to split water via electrolysis to make hydrogen. And then we need to expand our production of clean electricity. And then there are various end-use applications, such as medium heavy-duty transportation. There's applications in aviation, shipping, and various industries where electrification is problematic, particularly with providing process heat, chemical industry, glass making, cement, steel production. And we're now at the point where making progress in terms of technology readiness for these applications. And this is where the federal investment is critical to help with demonstration and deployment to then guide the scale up of the technologies that are effective and also uh, provide support for infrastructure in terms of moving the hydrogen uh, from production to end use applications. Thank you for that, Greg. Todd, I want to ask you a question about what Matt had shared in the introduction. You had spoken on the previous episode about the work around the study of future energy systems and the role that H2 could serve as we decarbonize the economy. The hypothetical has now become the reality with Mach H2. Can you give us an overview of what the pitch was for Mach H2 and what it means to the work you all are doing officially to have DOE backing? Sure. Yeah, thanks. So so everyone understands, Congress appropriated $8 billion to try to kickstart the hydrogen economy. So as Greg mentioned, that's production, transport, and use. And they set aside $7 billion to create these hydrogen hubs. And the idea behind the hubs, it's definitely focused at industry. Deployable technology, not, not a research project. Uh, they were meant to be regional and it was meant to sort of get beyond the chicken and egg problem. But you can imagine if you, if you want to use hydrogen as an end use, you need somebody to produce it. If you want to be a producer, you want to make sure you've got people that are the end users. And the idea was put a lot of federal funding behind that to get things moving. Right. So they put out seven billion dollars. These are going to be regional hubs. They had to include production, transportation, and end use. One of them had to have a nuclear component. One of them had to have a carbon capture and utilization and sequestration component. The others did, weren't restricted. And so around the country, many consortia came together, different project ideas, and they whittled it down from probably about a close, just short of 100 in the beginning to the seven finalists, and they're all regional. And so Mach H2 hub, right, has industries that are primarily focused in Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. And they've got a nuclear component, Constellation Energy, which runs the biggest biggest nuclear fleet in the US, uh, and BP, who would do carbon capture utilization. And then a lot of focus on the end use on transportation, some on industry, but also transporting, right? So you can see that the idea is that the DOE funding provides that little extra impetus to help industry start using, producing hydrogen, right? And you want to do it regionally. And this is just one of the seven teams around the country that formed to do that. I'd like to ask about the recently published IRS guidance related to the hydrogen production tax credit from the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, also known as 45V. The guidance was stricter than some wanted, perhaps disallowing hydrogen production from existing nuclear plants from claiming the credit. How will Mach H2 and its project be impacted by the guidance and how is Mach H2 working with DOE on moving the hub forward in coordination with these rules? Todd, why don't we start with you and then Greg can chime in. Yeah, so just so the listeners understand, the, the idea with 45V is you're going to get production tax credits. And the amount of tax credit you could get depends on how clean your hydrogen production is, right? So if you got down to 5% of the emissions of current hydrogen production technology, you get the maximum, right? And it would scale back depending on how far you were from 5%, 50%. So that was the motivation. The tax guidance that's come out, sort of um, the final draft, right? They're in a comment period before they make the rules final. The motivation, I think, was they didn't want a situation where you could divert current clean energy production that you were using for electricity over to hydrogen 
and then backfill the electricity using fossil fuels, right? They, they wanted to set up a situation where you're moving forward in clean. And then they, they set aside some rules to do that. One was regionality, right? You, you needed to be working within your region, produce the hydrogen near where you're going to use it. They wanted temporal matching, right? Meaning you're producing and using the hydrogen in close time proximity. Now in the early days, the idea is this could be matched annually, but eventually you have to get to hourly matching, right? So that was the second rule. And the third they called additionality, and there's three components to that. One, if you build new electrolyzers, they had to be built within three years of when you built the power production, right? So they're, they're, they're trying to incentivize new production. The second is you can use operating. So let's say I've got a current nuclear plant and I get permission from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to increase the allowed output by 5%. I can use that 5% to hydrogen because it's considered new, right? And then the third would be cur curtailment. And this is where it's a very useful concept for nuclear, which is sometimes nuclear plants are in markets where during certain parts of the day, they're not as economic in the electricity markets as say solar and wind, right? They would like to be able to divert their energy output to make hydrogen, right? So one of the proposed tax rules does allow curtailed electricity, or you have to prove, right, that it's curtailed electricity. But in every case, they're trying to incentivize new, right? Mm -hmm. So you understand the motivation, right, is to not allow you to just divert clean energy, right? The question is, is it enough, right? So right now, I can't give a specific answer as to how this is going to affect the hubs, but every country, not just our, every company, not just the ones in Mach 2, are looking at this set of tax rules and saying, is that a big enough incentive to get me to produce, right? And if the goal is to produce so that the end users have some confidence, Right. And then the producers say it's not enough where we can't do that. Mm -hmm. Then the whole thing doesn't get started and you lose the incentive. I think the DOE set up. So I think we're in this final period where the companies and the hubs will get this input back to the administration and we'll see where it ends up. But you, you can see the challenge, right? You want hydrogen. You want to kickstart that. You want it to be clean, right? You don't want more fossil fuels making it. And are your incentives set up to do that? Greg, anything to add? Yeah, I think uh, Todd really covered it well. When we look at the clean energy transition, clearly we need to shift off of the fossil fuels to renewables, nuclear. And if we have abundant clean electricity, we can really address end use and lower carbon emissions. We don't have infinite clean electricity. And, you know, the con concern was that we would be diverting some of this clean electricity from displacing fossil fuels onto the grid to hydrogen. And that's understandable, and you want to try to limit that. But at the same time, the current processes for making hydrogen are really inexpensive. The steam methane reforming is, you know, a dollar to two dollars a kilogram. From renewables, it's like seven and a half dollars a kilogram. So we need to bring down the cost. To bring down the cost in terms of production, we need to demonstrate, deploy, you know, through economy of scale, improve and reduce costs and make things more efficient. So it's not going to be perfect in, in terms of addressing the, you know, the ideal criteria, but in, in order to, you know, overcome the inertia of the current system uh, to one that's more lower carbon and efficient, we need to make these kinds of investments. Yeah, makes complete sense. So again, sticking to both of you, both your opinions on this, you know, we have a utility audience. That's what Energy Central is about. That's our mission. So what role will the participating utilities have in Mach H2? Where in the utility will this fall under? And, and what are they committing to participate given their slow and conservative approach to something that is not completely in their control? Again, uh, maybe Greg, you want to start first and then follow with Todd? Yeah, so in terms of driving the whole hydrogen economy to do it clean, we need to shift from the steam methane reforming production of hydrogen to using ele clean electricity and electrolysis. So utilities need to scale up in terms of this transition, their production in terms of nuclear and renewables. And then it's a matter of doing this economically. So it's, it's really understanding 
the services and electricity. So you could feed your electricity supply into the grid. You could use it to produce uh, hydrogen. And um, you also need to also manage uh, your loads on the grid, your other loads on the grid. So I think there's a lot of uh, learning that's going to take place with this demonstration and deployment. The other is we need to store hydrogen. Utilities have a lot of uh, knowledge and experience. Many are involved in electricity and natural gas. We store natural gas today. We need to learn how to store hydrogen. Uh, in Michigan, for example, we store, uh, there's opportunities to store uh, hydrogen in salt mines. So there's a, a lot with regard to the production and then utilities need to really look at what is the end use? What are the takers of the hydrogen and where are the opportunities there? And the industries are looking at what is the cost relative to the current supply of fuels. A lot of these industries are using natural gas today. But again, we got to shift from natural gas to low carbon fuels like carriers like hydrogen. But economics really is a key factor in business decisions. But this transition has to happen. You know, we're in a climate emergency. We need to make the shift. So uh, the earlier we uh, develop and demonstrate, the better we're going to be in terms of addressing the, the climate crisis. Greg, uh, staying with you for a moment, you know, as we mentioned, there are seven of these $1 billion hydrogen investments across the country. You know, share with us, what distinguishes Mach H2 from the others and, and why do you feel yours is best served to fulfill the goals set? Yeah, so as Todd mentioned, this competition required feedstock diversity. So production from fossil fuels, renewables, nuclear, and use diversity. So applications in various sectors. I think one of the things that's unique about this hub that's exciting is we have nuclear power as a, as a source for electricity, for electrolysis. There's also the production using fossil fuels with carbon sequestration, carbon capture and, and storage. And there is some renewable as well. And then I think what's really relevant to our region is a lot of the end use application is, is emphasizing transportation. So programs, for example, projects in Michigan that will be launched include an initiative of Michigan Infrastructure Office, Truck Stop the Future. So we need to shift in terms of transportation from diesel, of heavy-duty trucks, medium-duty, to carriers such as hydrogen. So that's a big part of this program in terms of, of the state of Michigan with the hub. There will be more fuel cell buses deployed in Michigan. They have a, a bus now. They're adding a couple more, but many buses coming online with this hub. And then uh, American Center for Mobility will be producing hydrogen for fueling trucks. So, you know, close to 30 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions in the country are from transportation. And as you know, Michigan's a leader in transportation. Now, light duty vehicles, it makes more sense to use electricity. And I could talk more about that later if we want. But where loads are heavy, hydrogen can play a role. When loads are heavy, electrification is difficult because the battery size, the range limitations, and the time for, you know, charging uh, trucks is problematic, much faster to do it with hydrogen. Great. I do want to talk to you, ask you both about the skeptics. So those who push back on hydrogen, worrying about, you know, the aspects like cost, safety, and how clean it really can be. So I would love to hear what your key messages are to answer that or address that. And, and why are you confident in the future of hydrogen, even with the challenges and perhaps risks that lay ahead? I think this is a good one to hear from both of you. Perhaps, Todd, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think the, I mean, laying out the challenges the way you did are, are important, right? I mean, hydrogen has to be cost effective if people are going to use hydrogen. You know, Greg mentioned, I think, already the steam methane reforming is really cheap, right? But it also is carbon -based. Right? So I think part of the motivation behind something like the hubs and tax credits is to look at how we drove the cost of renewables down. Right? We had sort of very thoughtful approach to that combined R and D and incentives to commercialization. Right, and then you have commercial competitions drove the prices down, and now we're in a position where we can deploy a lot of renewables. Like I wouldn't have believed it 25 years ago. Right, renewables were nit, they were niche, they were cute, right? But they're real, right? It's utility scale stuff, and so. It is a challenge to drive the cost down. It has to happen. But I think that's the point of the current government programs. 
I think safety is a question of getting people used to the fact that we're using hydrogen. That we use a lot of hydrogen already. You can go around the country. There's many industries that use hydrogen. I don't think most people know that. Right? In some ways, to me, it, it feels very much like the nuclear power issue, where the people close to the industry are very comfortable with it. The people that are sort of have the TV image of what this is, right? And so I think it's exporting that safety culture, making sure as the hubs build out that our workforce training programs pass along the knowledge of the way you work with this technology. So I think like many industrial things, success and good performance leads to getting past the safety issues. Greg, anything to add? Yes, I, I think Todd covered it well. I would just say one one challenge with, with hydrogen compared to something like natural gas, I mean, both are colorless, but natural gas, you could add mercaptan that make natural gas stink like sulfur. So if there's a leak, you could smell it. With hydrogen, that's going to be a challenge in terms of, you know, managing leaks. But as Todd indicated, there's a lot of tremendous amount of experience in the chemical industry today in terms of moving hydrogen around and working with hydrogen safely. I think, you know, there's exploration of do we use hydrogen and blend it and put it in the natural gas line so we could, you know, run our appliances in homes? You know, there, I think we, you know, we, we really need to think through, does that make sense from in a, in a long-term perspective? Because we have to get off the natural gas. And uh, there are limits of how much natural hydrogen could blend with natural gas. You could only, if you go up to 20%, you're only displacing 6% in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So the other is, you know, perception of hydrogen from the Hindenburg, the, you know, that blew up. I think, uh, you know, that turned people off for a long time with regard to fuel cell vehicles, our uh, concerns about those early on. But we have the capability to to do this safely. And it's just, as Todd indicated, there's a cost issue. And again, um, we got to drive those costs down through demonstration and expanding deployment and scaling up. Yeah. Well, let's talk for a moment about the impact on local economy. And since we're in Michigan, we'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the impact that hydrogen will play on the state economy here. So do you think this is the start of perhaps Michigan becoming known as a key hydrogen ground, like it long has been at the, the heart of the auto industry? And what are some of the concrete impacts they're expecting? And will it sustain well into the future? Uh, Greg, I believe this is probably more in your domain. Yeah, we've done a lot of research on transportation over the last few decades. And, you know, the state is really a leader in transportation. And, you know, we were with the internal combustion engine vehicle for 100 years, but the industry here has been doing pioneering work on fuel cell vehicles, electrification, with light duty vehicles. You know, they're really looking at fuel cells, but then battery costs have come down. We've improved the efficiency of batteries. So uh, the industry is really focusing on electrification for light duty vehicles. Um, and it makes a lot of sense from an efficiency point of view, too. With hydrogen, again, there's opportunities with medium and heavy duty vehicles where electrification is problematic. And maybe I should just, you know, share quickly. We take electricity, we charge a battery, we power the wheel. And it takes about one and a half units of electricity to produce one unit, drive uh, one unit to the wheel. If we do that on a light duty vehicle with, with hydrogen, we take about four and a half units of renewable electricity to split water. We lose 30% in the electrolyzer. Then we got to move to hydrogen and then we put it in a fuel cell to get the electricity back until we lose another half of it. So 4.5 in one unit to the wheel. For light duty, it doesn't make a lot of uh, a sense, but heavy duty where loads are great battery size is an issue, range is an issue, uh, hydrogen is, is really uh, the opportunity. And uh, the industry here is really, you know, focused on developing these vehicles, developing components. Michigan is a leading manufacturing state. A lot of industries, you know, grew up just related to mass production and, you know, not just automobiles, but just the techniques really went into furniture, went into appliances and things like that where we're leaders. Same opportunity here with regard to hydrogen, the hydrogen economy equipment is needed, like electrolyzers. And we have 
major investment coming into the state giga factory to make electrolyzers. GM is doing a lot of work on fuel cell production and not just uh, in terms of ground transportation, looking at aviation, rail. We have various industries that are dealing with storage, dealing with dispensing, the transport of hydrogen. So there's really a lot of opportunities in terms of the supply of equipment, of infrastructure that's needed to support transportation and hydrogen. And we have our Michigan Economic Development Corporation, our State of Michigan Infrastructure Office, City of Detroit. They're all working on supporting programs uh, to demonstrate and deploy hydrogen in the state. So when you have industry money coming in, you have government support, um, there's really an opportunity to become leaders. And I, I do see us playing a leading role in a hydrogen economy particularly focused around uh, transportation. Yeah, that's exciting. It sounds like a tremendous opportunity. Uh, well, it's also been a tremendous learning opportunity to be here today to talk to both of you about this massive undertaking that you're, you're leading. Really fascinating discussion. And Todd, you may remember from our lightning round from the previous episode that you were on, but Greg, to catch you up to speed on what we do next on the podcast, we're going to throw a few questions and your responses should be kept to one word or phrase. It gives us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about you, the person rather than the professional. So are you both ready, gentlemen? Ready. Thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Todd, we'll start with you, and then, Greg, you can, you can follow. So let's dive in. So Michigan's Governor Whitmer has asked you to pitch a new slogan for the state. What would it be? All right. So our current license plate slogan is Water Winter Wonderland. I'm going with Water Winter Wonderland, and we're keeping it that way. Thank you. I like it. Greg? Um, I'm going to stick, uh, focus a little around hydrogen. I'm going to say Michigan drives innovation and hydrogen-based climate solutions. Okay. For first-time visitors to the Michigan campus, what would you recommend this person visit? All right. Clearly, the country's number one ranked nuclear engineering department. Uh, but if that's not your thing, I'd say the behind-the-scenes uh, Michigan Stadium tour. I've heard that's pretty fascinating. Greg? And we're a leading school for environment and sustainability, and you could come visit us to see our work on an energy systems analysis. And I'm going to add one more. You know, we got a pretty cold winter right now. I'd recommend going to the University of Michigan Botanical Gardens, Mathai Botanical Gardens, and check out the conservatory, the greenhouses, and warm yourself up. Do you have any hidden talents? I'm going with running slowly. Okay. Greg? Growing large quantities of garlic in my front yard garden. Is there someone in your field, someone who may have influenced you or the field that you may not have received his or her due recognition? Now's the chance. Who would you like to honor and why? All right, so I'm going to stretch your question a little bit. I'm going to go with the Pips. Remember Gladys Knight in the Pips, the 70s singing sure. band? Gladys Knight, she's a famous, great singer, but it made it. She had these group of people behind her. Right. They didn't get the fame and fortune, but PIPs are clearly important for the success of an organization. Shout out to PIPs. OK, Greg. I'm going to focus on my academic training and I'm going to call out Professor Bob Cadillac that uh, taught me mathematical modeling of uh, chemical processes, which is really the foundation of my career. And I'll just point out one example of things he taught us to do. So he would come into the room with odd sort of project like sticking an ice cube in a cup of, of hot water and he'd tell us how many times would the ice cube flip before it would melt and we'd have to model that and so shout out to him for teaching me how to model complex systems okay in 10 and it years. takes about five flips by the way to, to uh, <laughs> five flips melt. okay make note of that in 10 years, the hydrogen hub matures and evolves and is part of the fabric of the economy as planned. So for each of you, what comes next? I'd say 10 years, probably retired and cheering all the students I helped become world leaders. I like that one. <laughs> for me, I'm riding a fuel cell bus to campus to attend a conference at Hill Auditorium. And I'm taking a hydrogen powered train uh, to vacation in northern Michigan. Fantastic. And lastly, uh, something that was a little unconventional, but we're going to ask it anyways. And we're, we're giving you the opportunity to challenge a future podcast guest. What's one question, energy focused or otherwise, 
you'd like to post to appear in the lightning round of a future episode? All right, I'm, I'm staying thematic, and my question is, who are your pips? Greg. <laughs> um, I'm kind of boring, but mine is, what do you do personally to reduce your energy and carbon footprint? Fantastic. Nicely done. For decision makers in the world of energy, what message about hydrogen energy and its deployment do you hope they take away from today's show? Greg, let's start with you. So we're in a climate emergency. Uh, we need to accelerate uh, clean energy transitions. So we really need to pursue these hydrogen solutions. And I'd emphasize focusing on technologies where there's a high degree of efficiency. The economics are going to sort themselves out. We should really look at thermodynamics and, and pick those technologies that have a promise uh, to do things efficiently in the future. Thank you. Todd? Yeah, I think my similar theme, uh, hydrogen will be an important energy carrier in a net zero world, and we should incentivize its use and be very thoughtful about where it provides the best value. Yeah, I also enjoy being part of the program today, and I'll just uh, call out to the audience that we have a number of resources on hydrogen and on our My Hydrogen website, and one in particular is a fact sheet. It's a two-pager that has dozens of statistics about hydrogen, the hydrogen economy, how it's produced, distributed, end-use applications, strategy, and policy. So you might want to check that out if you want a quick summary of some of the key uh, stats that we talked about today and, and ones that we didn't. Thanks. Absolutely. And we'll also make sure it's in the show notes. So thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation, and I thank you both for joining us today. And I'm eager to see the types of comments and questions our, our Energy Central community will share in response. So we'll look out for that and hope you hop back on to respond to them in the dialogue section of the website. And until then, though, we just want to thank you for sharing your insight with us on today's episode of the podcast. Yep. Always glad to join the conversation with you, Jason. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Our pleasure. And you can always reach our guests through the Energy Central platform where they welcome your questions or, and comments. And again, for our listeners, if you ever want to ask a question, you go to the Speak Pipe link on the show notes where you can leave a message and hear your voice on a future episode. And until then, thank you. And I also want to thank our sponsors of today's podcast. Thanks to West Monroe. West Monroe is a leading partner for the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities working together to drive grid modernization, clean energy, and workforce transformation. Our comprehensive services are designed to support utilities in advancing their digital transformation, building resilient operations, securing federal funding, and providing regulatory advisory support. With a multidisciplinary team of experts, West Monroe offers a holistic approach that addresses the challenges of the grid today and provides innovative solutions for a sustainable future. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com, and we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. Mm -hmm.